Hi everybody, Professor Gassimi here. We're on the third lecture of the Natural Language Processing course in CSE 842. Last week, we discussed natural language processing fundamentals and n-gram language models. This week, we're gonna be discussing classification models. So when I say classification, what do I mean by that? Well, classification is the process of assigning a continuous set of things in our world into groups according to some shared qualities or characteristics. You may recall in one of the previous lectures that we showed an illustration, which I'm also showing here on the right-hand side, of some of the most common English adjectives. Little, new, last, first, different, great, and so on. Well, if you pay attention to this list of commonly used English adjectives, you're going to notice that it contains a lot of the kinds of words that are helped for classification. So for example, old and young are two of the most commonly used English adjectives. Big and small are two of the most commonly used English adjectives. Last and first are as well. Now, if we think about these three examples, big and small give us a rough binary categorization of some phenomena, but then words like last and first are actually describing something about the rank or the order of phenomena. Now the fact that these words sort of show up preeminently within the English language and by extension are likely to show up preeminently in a lot of other languages indicate that Classification is something that we as a species sort of organically are very interested in performing. Now, the reason we're interested in classification is, you know, pretty obvious. It actually helps a lot with our survival. If you can classify things, you can take a very complex world, complex, continuous, noisy world, and you can make meaningful simplifications to that world so that you can operate in it more quickly and more effectively. Consider, for example, the label food. The food has a property called edible. So by classifying objects into a class called food, if I've never seen a slice of pizza before and you just tell me that that thing is called food, I can immediately know that that's edible, uh, it provides sustenance, and so on. Now, philosophically, all classification involves drawing lines of some kind. Those lines may not be one dimensional, but at the end of the day, you have to create a decision boundary between A and B, black and white, red and blue, and so on. Now, let's return back to one of the words that we saw were commonly used in the English language, big and small. Well, if I want to discriminate big from small, how do I do that? Where do I draw the line? Do I put it here? Do I put it here? Do I put it here? What I'm trying to show here is that the classification thresholds are subjective, right? But moreover, the way that a classification threshold is set is highly consequential for the way that an eventual classifier, something that wants to predict those classes, will work. Consider if we had set our decision boundary at the four marker there. What happens when you place your classification threshold at four is you're implicitly saying that 4.001 is closer to 10 or numbers much bigger than 10 than 3.99 is to 4.001. Now, in this particular example that I've chosen, this is a consequence of us taking something which might have been better cast as a regression problem and dealing with it in a classification sense. There are other problems, of course, that are more amenable just naturally to classification because they don't exist on a continuous scale like this. Consider, for example, comparing different kinds of fruit, apples versus oranges versus pears. The decision boundary thresholds there are a little bit more obvious and less subjective. I bring this to your attention because anytime you perform modeling or perform classification particularly, 
you should ask yourself whether classification is the right approach to be taking. Usually if you run into phenomena like this, where 4.001 is closer to 10 than 3.99 is to 4.001, it might provide you a hint that classification is actually not the right approach to the problem. Now, there's other interesting or important things to highlight about classification before we jump into it. Classification makes assumptions about perspectives and the consistency of the conditions that are available to the classifier. So consider, for example, our desire to classify the three images shown on the right-hand side as sand. All I've done in those three images is I've zoomed in on the three. Now, you can see that just changing the level of resolution really changes the core features we might look at to determine whether the object was sand or not. All of that is to say that consistency in the perspective that you hold as well is really critical to the performance and even the, the core capability of a classification model. And what distinguishes a good one from a great one is the ability to be robust to these kinds of conditions, these kinds of variations that you see on the right-hand side, either by explicitly building in an accounting process for the resolution or by identifying certain features that may be robust across the levels of resolution. When people perform classification, there's four major I would say modalities or paradigms. The first one is binary classification. That's when you have two groups and you want to distinguish between them. Yes or no, sick or healthy, long or short, true or false, and so on. The second is multinomial classification. That's when you have an observation and you want to assign it to one of the n groups. Let's say we have tweets we want to classify them as happy, sad, angry, joyous, fearful, etc. There's then ordinal classification, which pertains to assigning an observation to one of n ordered groups. So a baby is before a child, a child is before a teen, a teen is before an adult, and an adult is before an elder. So the categories there exist on some sort of a scale where there's a notion of categories that are neighbors. And finally, we have multi-class classification, which is where you assign observations to K of N groups. So we could have happy babies, we could have sad children. So that is the goal of the classifier is not just to provide a single class, but to provide a set of K classes. Okay, so one example of a binary classification problem that's phenomenally common is distinguishing spam from regular mail. If you have a, a poor spam filter in your inbox, you probably are familiar with the pains that that can cause you in your regular life. So spam filtering is actually an example of a binary classification problem that has a lot of impact on our lives. And what's important here is that spam classification is a natural language processing problem. If you and I read the sentence, hey friend, click this link to win a million dollars, we probably know that was spam compared to if, for instance, we got a message saying, hey John, that pizza was incredible. I'm ordering again for dinner tonight. You okay with that? So the fact that you and I can intuitively see that there are some differences or some evidence just based on the way that the language is constructed that tells us whether it's spam or not spam bodes well for building, let's say, a text-based or an NLP-based classification model to classify whether this is spam or not. So let's also look at an example of multinomial classification. If you had a set of emotions that were coming from tweets and you wanted to sort of categorize those emotions, that's an example of a multinomial classification problem. Let's say that you had some text available to you and you wanted to figure out whether a baby, a child, a teen, an adult, or an elder created that text. That would be an example of an ordinal classification problem because there's a natural way to order baby, children, teens, adults, and elders. That's how you know whether something's ordinal 
versus multinomial. Multinomial might be different kinds of fruits, apples, pears, and bananas. There's no obvious way to order those, but babies, children, teens, adults, and elders, there is a more obvious way to, to order those. And multinomial classification or ordinal classification can exist along more than one axis. And when it does, that's what multi-class classification is. So I could have a set of five by five classes that I'm interested in, whether someone is terribly upset all the way up to very happy along the y-axis, and whether someone is uh, a baby all the way up to an elder on another axis. And I might be interested in figuring out as a function of both of those axes, you know, whether a, for example, a happy college student produced some text or an angry child produced some text. And I might be interested in doing this multi-class style classification rather than just along one axis. So I think that the right way for us to appreciate classification models is by thinking through a very simple example of writing a spam filter. So let's assume that I came up to you and said, hey, let's have you write your very own spam filter. We're throwing out whatever your mail service provides. We're going to write one on your very own. And let's assume that you're not particularly excellent at natural language processing, at least not yet. Well, one approach you might take is to just enumerate a set of n-grams that mark items as spam or not spam. So you could say, for example, that if you see the n-gram million dollars, you're going to add a point to the spam category for whatever message contained the word million dollars. You could say that if a message contains the word pizza party, it gets a, a point in the not spam category. And you could say that if it contains the, the n-gram bank account, it gets a point in the spam category. And you could do this, obviously, for more than these three. You could kind of go on and on and on. Well, then for a new message, you could just apply your rules to do the classification, right? You could take a message like the one I've shown right over here that says, hey, Dave, that pizza party was incredible. I felt like a million dollars after all that pie. I feel like I'm going to drain my bank account with all this pizza. Well, then the approach that you might take is to sum up the total number of spam, let's say, identifiers that you found. So two out of the three spam identifiers were found and it's over some threshold. Maybe it's 15% in your case. You're going to mark that as spam and you're not going to bother to read it. Now, what you would have done in this case is actually not terribly far from what happens in a lot of traditional natural language processing systems. People create handcrafted features that try to provide some kind of evidence for whether a, a message might be spam or not. And then they usually augment that with some statistical features as well, such as uh, looking at a relationship between the n-grams and the incidence of a message being spam, for example. Uh, of course, in this particular example we went through, the handcrafted spam filter was not a very good one because creating a good quality spam filter with handwritten rules probably takes a lot of effort. In fact, not probably, it certainly takes a lot of effort. Now, machine learning is the process of automatically learning models. Okay, so what we discussed in the previous slide with the set of three if statements was a model, right? Machine learning is about learning some of these models automatically, but using, in most cases, the properties of the data itself. Now, what distinguishes some traditional machine learning techniques from more contemporary machine learning techniques has to do with how much refinement has been done to that data. For example, if we extracted a set of features from the raw text of the language, and we put those into a statistical model of some kind of classifier like logistic regression or naive Bayes, which we will be discussing here shortly, that would be an example of one of the classical approaches to performing machine learning. And then the more contemporary approaches to machine learning try to avoid the feature engineering completely and just use the data to learn what distinguishes spam, for example, from not spam. So when you have any kind of data that's annotated in the machine learning context, and data, by the way, in natural language processing is just text or speech, 
You have any kind of data though, and it's annotated, that's a supervised machine learning problem. If you don't have an annotation, it's an unsupervised machine learning problem. Keeping on this track of a spam filtration system, let's assume that we wanted to train a machine learning model to classify messages as spam or not spam. Well, to start, we might label some messages we've previously seen as spam and not spam, right? We're, doing a, we're gonna do a supervised machine learning model. So if you wanna supervise this thing, you gotta give it some training data that it can learn from. Okay, well, a natural thing we might do then next is take the words, the histogram, let's say, of the words that show up in the normal messages. I've illustrated those as blue bars here. So let's say, hey, is the most common word that shows up in the non-spam messages that we annotated followed by John, then by pizza, then by mom, then by link. Now let's say that um, those words also exist within the spam world. We can also similarly count their incidents. And if we plot those two things side by side between the spam messages and the regular messages, and let's assume that we've kind of normalized to account for the fact that there's a different number of spam messages than there are from regular messages, well then, we can start to, using these properties of the language, pull out unigrams that might be indicative of not spam or spam. So we don't have to actually sit like we did earlier and write out what might be indicative of spam or not spam. We can just let the data tell us, given the labels we provided, what was spam and not spam. In this case, John and pizza indicate not spam. The word link indicates spam. Now, if you also glance at this, when you're taking a data-driven approach to things, you start to get an intuition for how machine learning models are go about going about rank ordering feature importance. Look at, for example, the difference between the size of the red bar for the word link and the size of the blue bar for the word link. Red bar is proportionally much larger than the blue bar. But what that indicates is that the word link is a really good discriminator between spam and not spam. Whereas the word pizza, let's say, is not as good of a discriminator. It still does discriminate, you could argue, just not as well as link does.